All right, folks, I'm going to start now. Um, thanks for coming. Um, our brains are uh, made up of tens of bil billions of neurons, um, which change their firing patterns moment to moment as we move through the world. Uh, they work together in a coherent way. Uh, these are coordinated patterns uh, that are produced to give rise to everything about our, our human experience, our, our sensory perception, our rich internal mental lives, um, our motor actions that we use to interact with the environment. Um, it is now possible in recent years to finally record a sizable number of these neurons, um, tens of thousands uh, in mice and zebrafish. Uh, and this was driven by technological developments, um, a lot of them here as it happens, uh, in, in two-photon calcium imaging and electrophysiology. But now we're faced with a different problem. Now we have these high dimensional data sets, lots of neurons recorded at the same time for hours on end. Um, we need to develop the methods, uh, the tools, computational and, and mathematical to analyze this data, to try to understand it in, in a way that, that gives us insight about um, neural computations. And a lot of my talk today is going to be um, essentially to, to that extent, uh, it's going to include a lot of uh, work that we started years ago that we're finishing here, uh, as well as a little bit of, of what we're starting to do here at Genelia. And at Genelia, really our goals are to combine these three different things. Um, large scale neural recordings, um, some interesting foraging and, and virtual reality tasks where there are complex high dimensional tasks, uh, as well as, as tracking and analyzing as much of about uh, an animal's, in this case mice, uh, mice's behaviors as possible. But as you might imagine, doing all these three things and, and getting all that data, analyzing it, it's going to be difficult. Um, I'm going to start simple today with some uh, more simple scenarios uh, that are hopefully going to, to lay the ground for uh, the kinds of analysis we need when we go to, to, to realistic, interesting uh, cognitive behaviors. And so the first story I'm going to tell you about uh, is about neural ongoing uh, activity in complete darkness, no sensory stimulation. And the second one is just going to be us bringing in a large battery of, of visual stimuli, showing them to these mice um, and uh, trying to interpret what we see. And as I said, a lot of this work was started before we came to Genelia. Most of the data has been collected in London, uh, but most of the analysis actually have been done uh, in equal collaboration with, with Carson Stringer, um, who is also here at Genelia with us. And these two stories correspond to two preprints. Um, and um, I'm going to go over and beyond what's, what's in those papers, but if you ever want to go back and to something you saw, uh, these are going to be pretty good references. So I'm gonna start with actually the data set we've been analyzing most recently. And this is a data set of, of neuropixel probes um, implanted, uh, well, just pushed into a mouse brain. Um, you all know very well about these probes from, from Tim and other people here that have used, developed and used them. Uh, 384 channels on a single narrow shank. Uh, roughly, we get one neuron per channel. And the experiment I'm gonna tell you about is special in that it, at the same time, implanted eight of these probes into a mouse brain simultaneously. So Nick Steinmetz, our, our great collaborator um, from, from London, who now has started his own lab at the University of Washington, uh, he had this kind of setup to, to implant the probes. And this was difficult, so it, it didn't become his like main setup, but he did manage to take about three of these recordings in, in, in three different mice, um, eight probe neural pixels data sets, uh, 3,000 channels simultaneously uh, in an awake mouse, uh, kind of sitting there and maybe moving and you know watching some stimuli, stuff like that. And that's what the data looks like. Every color here, a different probe from one of these mice. Every dot is a spike uh, from one of those probes. And it's a one second of neural activity 
and you can not see a lot of structure here, but uh, I'm going to um, show you how we go about extracting structure from, from these kinds of patterns. But before we go there, I want to tell you a, a story about these really impressive data sets, uh, which is that after Nick collected them, uh, they set, in fact, um, on the network drives for about a year unanalyzed. And why was that? This was like the most amazing EFES data set you can have um, in a mouse, and they were just sitting there unanalyzed. And the reason is that um, some of you might know, uh, you can't just use the raw data and go about analyzing uh, neural patterns. You have to first spike sort it. You have to extract the spikes from these raw streams of data um, through a clustering process that's pretty difficult and complicated, and importantly, not fully automated. So even after our best algorithms uh, that we had at the time were finished, Nick would still have to spend three more hours for each one of the probes uh, to really get us the neurons, essentially. And so eight probes, that's 25 hours per probe for an experiment that already was complicated and took three hours in total. So you can imagine he was a little bit daunted by the prospect, um, and in fact, the data was unanalyzed until we came about um, and we develop an, an, a more automated algorithm. And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that algorithm first. The problem is you get raw data that looks like this, and, and even for the experts electrophysiologists, this is gonna look a little bit funny because I really like to plot it here as, a, as an image, an electrical image of the probe recording where every single channel is a row through here, and instead of the wiggles you're used to, uh, from electrophysiology, we just have uh, pixel colors and brightnesses. And every little um, blue kind of stri stripe through this plot uh, is another spike. And the problem is to take this data and tell which spikes, which, 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 um, which little stripes correspond to the same neuron and which are, are different neurons. And so at the end of this process, we should end up with something like this. Well, this is actually what we end up with, where I've replaced every little stripe with a reconstruction from the model of that stripe. And it's a little bit processed, but every little stripe here has a bit of a spatiotemporal pattern of the electrical voltage that neuron we found uh, corresponded to in, in the real data. And um, the reason why this problem is, is, is complicated, and let me just go back a, a bit, there has been spike sorting almost for as long as there have been multi-channel electrophysiological recordings. It's, it's, it's a common thing. Everyone knows they have to do it. They have to do it well. Um, so how come you know, we haven't solved this problem yet? And the reason is, in fact, a lot of people thought they solved this problem. In fact, lots of algorithms coming out, even in recent years, um, all the time algorithms come out and they look really good on artificial data, such as the data I simulated here, actually that Jennifer Colonel simulated here. And what Jennifer did is she did a, a plain simulation like anyone else would do. Um, and uh, you can see that when we take kilosort one, the algorithm I built in GeroClust, the algorithm built at Genelia by James June, uh, and we run it on this, and you know, it's, it's a reasonable simulation. It's just not, doesn't have something important in it. Uh, we recover a lot of the neurons. And we really don't care about going to 74. I mean, anything like this, recover 50 neurons you know, automatically, that's, that's amazing performance. If we could get that in real data, we'd be done. Uh, but you take these algorithms to real data and they perform really poorly. And so that's when the human curator has to come in and kind of patch the, um, the little pieces that the algorithm spits out and, and fix them, fix all the errors. And so, what we spent a lot of time thinking about and, and identifying was the source of, of the problem. Why, why is there such a discrepancy? Um, and the main problem we identified was that um, the main sources of, of changes, of non-stationarities across the recording that might you know, make the algorithms mess up, because the algorithms are, think they're getting the same kind of data all the time, but in fact, the data is changing during the recording. And it's changing in these very organized ways when you look across neurons, and these are three from the same recording. There are some slow changes as a function of time. This is a whole hour of recording, by the way. Um, and these are just amplitudes of these neurons, just how big the spikes appear to be, how bright on that previous picture. 
Uh, and you can see that the, the amplitudes vary. That's, that's not what they should be doing. That's not a, a biological, kind of physiological uh, process. Um, when neurons spike, you know, spike is all or nothing. There's a little bit of variability, but for the most part, the extracellular waveform uh, is very reproducible. It should always be the same amplitude. But it was definitely not, and it had particular kind of um, structure, and that's known as drift. This is the probe moving with respect to the brain. It can happen for a variety of reasons. Uh, a lot of them have to do with, with the animals being awake and moving around and moving their brains. Um, some of them are, are slower relaxations that have to do with brain temperature and uh, relaxation of the tissue of the insertion of a probe and, and so on. But they're all the same kind of problem. The electrode moves relative to the brain. And so when we make now a simulation that the only thing we've added was drift, this, this amount of kind of a reasonable amount of drift of the probe, you can see all of a sudden these algorithms break. So we're not recovering anywhere near as many neurons. Um, it, the output of the algorithm looks a lot more like what we're used to from, from real recordings. However, um, if we include a drift correction step, and I'm just going to, to not give you the details, it's, it's pretty complex the way exactly in which we track drift as a function of time, but as soon as we include drift in our algorithm, um, this is Kilosort 2 that we've released recently. And uh, if you look at its performance now on these simulations with drift, uh, you see that we recover back this kind of nice level of performance when the probe wasn't moving at all. Uh, and yeah, of course, if the probe is stationary, then it has no problem. Um, there's a few more optimizations going on in Kilosort 2 that allow it to do even better than Kilosort 1 when there is no drift. Uh, but overall, this is an algorithm that has significantly reduced our collaborators' kind of manual burden. They're no longer um, dreading that step after they do spike sorting where they have to uh, refine the outcome of the algorithm. And so this has been instrumental to take those data sets I told you were sitting for a year uh, on the network in, in the Carandini Harris lab, uh, run them through Kilosort 2, and now we have the actual neurons with their firing times uh, for these data sets. Okay, but as I said, that's, that's okay, that, that's more interpretable data, right? It's more interpretable than raw voltages, but still haven't, we haven't done a lot in terms of understanding patterns of neural activity across neurons and across the brain as a whole. And to, to get you into the spirit of the kinds of analyses we, we develop and run, I'm going to uh, show you the simple example. Consider this as like a, a corner of the matrix of neural activity we record. Just five neurons out of maybe 10,000, um, six stimuli out of maybe a few thousand, this could be time points as well. If we were not showing stimuli, it's just an animal in complete darkness. This could be a, a time period, let's say, of one second or of 100 milliseconds. You can discretize however you want. Uh, and the entries in this big table, this big matrix, are just how many times did that neuron fire to that stimulus on that particular trial, on that particular instant of time. And what we're looking for are patterns that are repeatable across neurons or across stimuli, but let's look at across neurons. Uh, we look for suspicious coincidences where we see different neurons having similar patterns of neural firing because those tell us that those patterns are probably representing something meaningful, some common input to these neurons. It may be an outside variable that's being represented. It may be an internal variable, but at least we know it's probably not noise because if it was noise, it would be kind of limited to single neuron activity, there will be kind of no reason for it to kind of spread through the network. And so with these kinds of clustering methods, we can you know, get our cluster of neurons and I push them all up. Uh, and then maybe we can go down and find more patterns of activity that are repeatable. Um, and we can kind of continue to reorganize this table along neurons, maybe even along stimuli. Uh, but I'm gonna show you what it looks like if you reorganize this table along neurons such that nearby neurons have very similar patterns of activity. And I'm not gonna go too much into this, but there's a confound that there's also a lot of noise here. You'll never find a few neurons that have exactly the same pattern of activity. There's always gonna be noise that we have to deal with. 
And so when you do that in Nick's data, the eight probe data sets, you get the representation like this, where now the spikes are black and the y-axis are the neurons like before. X-axis is time, but it's a lot more time than before. This is uh, 20, 30 minutes or so of a recording. And you can see that the neurons have been sorted by their patterns of firing. There are groups that are active at certain times where there's a lot of black and not active at other times. Um, and in general, just the pattern that you might see just changes as you go through this block. But it changes continuously because that's how we build this algorithm that we call raster map. We've built it to kind of slowly change the patterns uh, of, of our kind of axis here in Y, our embedding dimension. And if we assign a dot to every single neuron at the same height, it appears in this table. Uh, and the dot also has the information of the depth along the probe where it was found, that particular neuron that also corresponds to some particular brain area. And you know, we do quite a bit of work to figure out exactly where neur what neuron is where and what area it's coming from. Uh, and what you can see is that every color is kind of distributed across depth here. There's some amount of clustering, like little this red thing here, maybe blue. Uh, but overall, every brain area seems to have a nice sampling of all these different patterns of, of activity that are going on over the whole brain at the same time. So this is not really what we expected to see, right? We expected to see that when we do clustering, neurons in the same brain area might be doing similar things. So they should all show up in one particular part of the table together. They should be a lot more clustered than this. The fact that every area has a sampling from this multi-dimensional continuum tells us that every area has access to this kind of high dimensional information that's represented in the brain as a whole. And when we go ahead and try to understand where this information might be coming from, what are the neurons coding for, uh, we made a, a, a big advance by just thinking of um, really, we make the bigger advance by just thinking, what is the only thing that we have external to this mouse that we might be able to correlate to this neural activity? And the only thing we had, because this is a mouse in complete darkness, the only thing we had is an infrared camera on the face of the mouse. And we just somehow got lucky and uh, imaged the entire face of the mouse as opposed to, we're, we're in a visual uh, cortex lab, so this camera was really just for tracking the eye. Uh, but if you track the entire face, then you get a lot more information about what this mouse is doing at any one time. It's patterns of whisking and sniffing and running and all these other kind of what we call spontaneous behaviors, things that the animal just does. If it's there in the dark, has nothing else to do. It'll just engage in, in its normal repertoire of, of spontaneous behaviors. And we take those movies and we process them a little bit, not too much. Uh, to extract some, some time courses, right? So some behavioral patterns of activity over time. Um, we do that by computing differences of consecutive frames in that movie, rectifying them, and that's the motion energy. It's bright when a particular area of the video is, has a lot of movement in it. Uh, and then we have a movie of these frames of motion energy. So as many frames as we collected, maybe let's say 100,000. And we just take the PCA of that we take the highest variance dimensions of this movie and we end up with principal components of this sort, PC1, 2, 3. PC1 has all positive weights onto most pixels on the mouse face. That means it's capturing global motion that's happening all over the face. And PC2 has some pixels that are bright here and dark there, so it's just some contrast between whisking in this case and the rest of the face and in this case, it's sniffing versus the rest of the face, and so on. We actually take 500 of these PCs, each one of them having its own activity time course that may or may not correlate with something that happens in the brain. And we build a predictive model from those traces to the neural activity, uh, and then we look at what the prediction looks like. And if you look carefully at the, at the kind of big splotches of black here, they're more or less in the, they're in the same place, the big ones are. Um, and then, you know, to some level, some other finer patterns are, are captured to a lesser extent and so on. Smaller features might disappear, but we've broadly captured the, the, the big structure in, in this neural activity that we recorded. And if we quantify that, 
separately for every brain area in this experiment, we get something that looks like this. This is variance explained of single neuron activity on test data. This is test data too, by the way. On test data, using these behavioral predictors. And what you see about these curves is that they're mostly offset from each other. So that means their, their first entry here as a function of dimensions we consider uh, is, is offset. Now these dimensions are essentially the, the number of kind of reduced dimensionality behavioral predictors that we can use to predict neural activity. And you can see that the first one has a lot of variance in, in all brain areas. Uh, and then there's about as much more variance if you sum up the next 16 or so predictors. And the big one is all just about, you know, essentially the total amount of, of, of arousal or uh, behavioral activity that, that the mouse is doing. It's mostly transitioning between periods of high arousal and, and, and low arousal, passive, just sitting there, no motion at all on the face. Uh, and that's what drives a lot of the biggest patterns that you see here in, in, in these firing raster maps. Um, but then there's also some kind of higher dimensional information in these further modes. And if we now uh, do a, a finer time scale prediction um, analysis, we want to know is the brain activity coming after uh, the behavioral patterns or before it? Um, that might tell us something about what they might represent. Uh, but what you see here is that the peak of these prediction curves as a function of time lag from behavior is pretty much dead on zero. It is, however, a very broad curve. So if you move out one, two, even three seconds into the future or into the past, you can still predict neural activity from future behavior or past behavior. Now, that's not anything special, really. That's all that's telling us is that the, these predictors that we're using and the neural activity, they have these long time scale correlations on the order of seconds. And we're able to use those really to, uh, to predict neural activity. Yeah. Yeah, if, if you keep some, so this is electrophysiology data, so we can go as fine scale as we want, and we, can, yeah, 50 hertz is the camera, so we cannot go beyond that. But in our experience, yeah, there's nothing much, nothing special happens here. The, this peak here has a width of maybe a second, maybe a bit less, a sub-second peak, so that could well correspond to different processes, uh, but then these these broad shoulders are, uh, are always there. Okay, so um, ah, here's a lot more examples uh, from different mice. At the top is always the raster map. So this is our map of brain activity with neurons sorted along the y-axis and, and time along the x-axis. And it's always a lot of time. This is, again, 20 minutes or so. Um, on these kinds of low time scales, there are fluctuations in neural activity we can capture and we can predict from, from behavior. Okay, and what you weren't supposed to see was that we did this with a completely different uh, way of recording neural activity with two photon calcium imaging. And of course, calcium imaging does not have um, very good temporal resolution, as we all know. Um, however, for these kinds of questions where the, the patterning of neural activity you're looking for is fairly slow, it's, it's actually an, an ideal way uh, of studying them. Now, going into the second part of my talk, yes. This one, yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't say these are too different, in fact. Um, there's, I think there are two processing going on that are mixed of di with different degrees in different brain regions. So what you might see here as kind of broader shoulders or less broad uh, are, a lot of them have to do with this first dimension, which is the thing that varies the most between brain regions is just how correlated are they to arousal. Um, 
at the minimum, in an area like visual cortex down here, you know, just 5% of the variance is related directly to, you know, uh, arousal in the sense of active versus passive transitions. In an area like thalamus up here, it's 25%. It's a lot more. Uh, but in all cases, this kind of, and we have some analysis to suggest that all this kind of, the climbing of these curves beyond the first dimension, that corresponds mostly to that central peak there in the time courses. So that's, that's kind of, those are the those are preliminary analysis, but it, it does look, uh, look like that. So you might imagine if you wanted, um, and we are pursuing this further, that the low dimensional activity, this one dimension of arousal is the thing that has the slow seconds time scale time course and corresponds to the shoulders. Whereas the kind of more interesting, higher dimensional patterns of you know, whisking without running or sniffing without whisking, et cetera, those higher dimensional patterns are the things that are transitioning much more quickly on each bout of alertness, on each bout of arousal. And those have faster time scales, um, and those are actually have more similar distribution along brain areas in terms of variance explained. Yeah, so we've learned from this that um, if you just study neural activity in complete darkness, you can learn something. The brain at all times, at least of mice, um, is, is, has ongoing patterns that are, are brain-wide. They're not localized to brain areas. Uh, they're really distributed um, all the, okay, I don't want to push it too far. I don't want to say that all the brain areas are talking to each other because we don't know that, but they're definitely representing similar kinds of things. And so what happens when you turn the screen on uh, and start showing uh, pictures to visual cortex? Um, and actually to study this, a lot of the data I'm going to show you is going to be in a very classical kind of scenario where uh, we're just going to flash images for half a second or so uh, and just going to keep flashing them at intervals of one to two seconds. And for each one of those responses, we're going to take our, our calcium data sampled sparsely in time. Um, and every image is going to have one particular pattern of firing across neurons. And that, that's our entry into our matrix, uh, that matrix of stimuli by neurons that we want to analyze. The data we started with looks like this, just multi-plane recordings in visual cortex, um, some number of planes, 10, 15, 20, uh, however we, many we can get in there. And every little image here is a plane, and images come on, and there's a big increase in activity, uh, and then different cells light up to different images. These are, for the most part, um, recordings in GCAM6 transgenic mice. Uh, our acquisition rate, about 3 hertz. And from recordings like this, uh, we can obtain something like 10,000 cells. In this case, this is a good example. Actually, when we moved to Geneva, we got a bump in the number of cells recorded kind of for free. Now we're at maybe like 2,000 cells at this rate, slow rate of acquisition, 3 hertz. Uh, and you can see. These are still distributed across planes in this case. Um, here's a zoom in version of that to show you that we, we get like nice little masks for each one of these cells. They are well defined. Uh, this is all done by a piece of software called Sweet2P that we've been developing for a long time. And that one has seen improvements over the years, um, a lot of them since we moved to Genelia. Uh, now it's a, it's a Python framework and we've tested in a lot more kinds of data. Let's see, here's, for example, the mesoscope data from the mesoscope upstairs, uh, what it looks like. I'm not sure what this mouse is doing, but you're all familiar with the technology. You have a big window, uh, and you can record from a piece of cortex that now has maybe all of visual cortex at the same time, not just a, a tiny piece of it. And we can similarly extract cells from that with C2P and also get uh, a large number of cells. All right, and so now I want to get to the, the, the question that I think a lot of people ask me when I go in and give talks elsewhere. Uh, did we really need to record so many neurons? What, what are we gaining out of this? How should we use these recordings if they are um, giving us something new that we didn't have before? Uh, and I think that's a question on, on many people's minds uh, at the moment. Oh, so let's try to answer that. Now there's, sorry, there, there's one very straightforward thing that no one would really dispute is you just get more information from the brain. So uh, 
whatever it is that, that you're doing, you're showing some stimuli or monitoring some behaviors, um, your neurons are going to have more information about whatever computation you're, you're studying. And in this particular case, if we show 2,800 images, we predict the identity on a test set from these neurons, 10,000 cell recordings in this case. You can see here on a log-log scale that the more neurons we record, the better we can predict the identity of the image. Now, I should say that didn't have to be the case. These curves could have plateaued at some intermediate level just because there might not be all that information in the brain. Um, at least that's what some people would have predicted. They, they plateau up here, you know, around one fraction correct, so around 100%. The average is about 50%. And you can see that if you just had a recording of 100 neurons or so, then maybe your prediction would be 10 to the minus 2, so 1%. Uh, so, not so not so great. OK, this just shows we have more information. Oops, sorry about that. Now, we can also do this the other way around. We can take those spontaneous behaviors I was, I was telling you about and predict the neurons from them. And now, every neuron has some kind of prediction from this external variable. So it might seem strange, actually, in this case, that as we consider more neurons, our prediction still goes up. And it's still it's, it's a function of dimensions here. So you should just look at the peak of these curves. That's our maximum predicted variance. And the peaks also go up, go up as we increase the number of neurons. And the reason this happened is a bit more subtle. In this case, it helped us to record more neurons because that helps us to figure out which other neurons you, know, you are more similar to. Which neurons are you correlated to and represent the same kinds of behavioral variables in together with? And if we can know that, then simply by using the activity of all these other you know, similar neurons to you, we can make a better job at predicting uh, this particular neuron we're trying to predict. And that's how that, that happens. Uh, it also helps with this other arrow of, of prediction. And yet, that's still all telling us you have more neurons, then you have more information from the brain. Okay, but it's not what most people care about when they ask this question. They want to know, did we learn something qualitatively new? Is there something more in the activity of 10,000 neurons at the same time that I couldn't have gotten from, from 100 neurons? And to answer that question, it's, it's a little bit more tricky. Um, people that ask these questions usually think they've won by this point because they know that they can just go about and record their cells one at a time. And they'll probably, at least for some things, that will be good, good enough. So we took this question to heart. And um, we realized that it implies a question about uh, the patterns of correlations between neurons. How low dimensional is the neural activity in the brain at any one time? And by low dimensional, I mean, a lot of you may be familiar with these concepts, but I'm gonna go slowly. I mean that the activity of the entire recording, let's say 10,000 neurons, maybe entire brain, you know, millions, billions of neurons, maybe that all that activity can be represented with just a few variables, reduced dimensionality variables. So, when you run your, your PCA, your principal components analysis, or your favorite dimensionality reduction algorithm, maybe you didn't need 10,000 neurons because only, let's say, three are sufficient to describe the state of the system at any one time. And if that was the case, then, you know, aha, now it means we can, it's enough to record the subset of the neurons and we'll know the state of the entire system because the state is really distributed in the patterns of correlations between neurons. There are lots, in other words, using the analogy that I started with, there are lots of neurons that look the same, that have similar patterns of firing. I don't need to record all of them. I can just record one or a few, and I'll instantaneously know information about all the ones that I didn't record. But that would only be the case if brain activity was low dimensional in some way. And so, to quantify in real recordings how low dimensional brain activity might be in these visually evoked um, data sets, um, what you might do is you might have a dot for every pattern of firing in this kind of, in this case, three dimensional space. Every dot has a particular coordinate on these axes that tells you how active that neuron was at the time. 
And you have to imagine that we have axes four through 10,000 sticking out of the plane. And if there's a single dot for every stimulus presentation, we can make up our collection of dots and we can start fitting planes through it. And fitting planes or, yeah, fitting planes essentially is what PCA does. You take PCA of the data, it finds the dimension of largest variance for this toy data set, it would be this dimension. And that's dimension one, and it take another dimension along this direction, and another dimension along this direction. And you keep going, um, and you measure at every dimension how much variance there is along that dimension. And if it's low dimensional, then this process should get you to a variance of zero pretty quickly. Um, but if it's not, then you'll just keep having components. The, their variance has to keep going down because you always pick the one of most variants, but it, it might go down very slow. And so what happens when we look in real data and, and try, to, um, try to fit planes like this to real data? Here I'm showing you the cumulative variance of these principal component dimensions. And we start here, it's on a logarithmic scale. And if you're looking at the yellow line, you can see that in fact, it never saturates, right? It goes up as high as the biggest dimension we, we measured was. And that's all the way out to, 10, to 1,000 here. We could have gone a bit further. There is no level of variance to say that, you know, if I want 95% of the variance in my data, how many components do I have to take? Well, in this case, you know, it would be 500 probably or so. Um, but really, we believe that as we keep increasing the number of neurons and the number of images, this curve would just keep going up. There's no reason not to. And there's a control here as well on this figure that you're seeing. When we only showed 32 images, but we repeated them a lot of times, uh, in that case, we actually only got 32 dimensions, as was expected, because there's only 32 firing patterns. We, we could not evoke more. So that's one of the other constraints that we have here is how many images can we show? Well, that's probably as high dimensional of a data set as we are going to record on that day. So the answer is no to this question. And we went a little bit further and notice this curve actually has a bit of a funny shape in that it's linear. And we plotted it instead, uh, instead of plotting it in this cumulative way, we plotted the variance of every dimension separately. And then it looks like this other yellow curve. And every point here is the total amount of variance for every dimension. So it's just the thing we started with without doing this cumulative step. And the reason you can't see most of it is because it's behind this very good linear fit to it. And it's a linear fit when both of these axes are logarithmic. And that makes it a power law because it corresponds to a mathematical formula like this, one over n to the alpha, n is the, the x-axis here, one over n to the alpha is the amount of variance that exists in component n. And so what this tells us is that it's essentially it's a slow decay. A power law is, is a slow decay uh, of variance. Now, I'm not going to go into the, we, we weren't quite happy with describing it as a power law. Okay, that's nice, but okay, so what? What does that tell us about, about these patterns? Uh, we know, okay, they're not low dimensional, so that's information to have, but why does it, what does it mean this curve decays in exactly this fashion? Why, isn't, why is it so straight as well? That, that was surprising too to us. And we developed a little bit of a theory. And I wouldn't say we developed it as we kind of took out the math books and started looking for uh, ways that we might explain this particular decay of variance. And, we, we arrived at, at, at some conclusions that I invite you to look into the preprint for, for the mathematical side of. I'm going to try to give you the intuition instead, why this curve might be decaying exactly at this rate. The answer is um, it could have decayed faster, right? It could have been low dimensional, in fact. It could have been only a few points have any variance at all, and then you fall to zero. Or it could have decayed faster than this alpha, or it could have decayed slower than this alpha. But slower is what it actually couldn't have decayed mathematically because of a property of smooth continuous differentiable functions. So if you think of the brain for this purposes as a simple input output machine, 
when you change the input a little bit, so the images that we see on our retina, brain activity should only change a little bit. So in this plot, if the input had, if the stimulus we've shown would only change the bit, this point can go there, it has to stay fairly close. That's just a property of smoothness. Turns out when you enforce smoothness to any mathematical object like this, it means you have to decay at least as fast as this. You can go faster, but you can't go slower. You can have infinite number of dimensions that have a lot of variance. It has to keep decaying, meaning that the smaller dimensions just you know, have to keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So that's the, the mathematical intuition, but now let's do it in pictures again. And to do it in pictures, I'm going to take advantage of an analogy. So we notice that power law spectra are very common in all sorts of data sets. Not just the V1 stimulus data set I've shown you, also in spontaneous activity, so the other data sets I, I've shown you, the power law has a, actually a pretty similar alpha exponent there. It's also very high dimensional, you know, more noisy, uh, but it's also very high dimensional. And then we looked at some of Misha's data in his labs. Um, and this is also a power law kind of spectrum, whole brain, 60,000 neuron recording or so. It has a slightly different alpha, a little bit larger. So that means it's, it's more dominated by these, these eigenvalues, these dimensions, you know, these top few dimensions than these other data sets. Um, nonetheless, it still kind of decays in, in this kind of linear rate. And then we looked at completely different data sets that have nothing to do with neurons. In one case, natural images, just taking a data set of nat natural images, treating every pixel the way we have treated neurons in our recordings. And again, power law. Power exponent is now about 1.1. This one was well known in the community, and it's actually not known to this day what causes it. It's a bit of a mystery as well. But then you look at other data sets, a corpus of English language documents, social networks, um, basically the matrix of um, who follows who, and you can take the eigenspectrum of that matrix. You get similar kinds of power laws all over the place with different exponents. Uh, and actually we have a bit of a theory for what dictates the exponent, but that's just for the paper, if you wanna look at it. And now, okay, so if this is such a pervasive phenomenon, maybe we can understand it with the one data set that we all have really good intuition about. And that data set is that of natural images. We all look at an image, we know right away what's, what's going on in it, right? And so, <laughs> Those are images like this. Um, this is one that we actually took from our experiment that we showed to the mice. And what, they all, what the images have in common is that they have structure at all sorts of different spatial scales. There's structure at the scale of the whole image, right? There's a big object in there. But then there's the leaves themselves. They're kind of independent. And if you look at the leaves inside, they have striations that are kind of at an even smaller scale too. And you take the... The, the, you take the PCA of a data set of many such images and you get the principal components of natural images that look like this. And these are just Fourier basis components for those of you who know what those are. Uh, but really what they are is, is from top to bottom, you just start looking at higher frequency content in these images. That, that's all there is. And the way that that variance decays over dimensions has this very specific uh, formula. In particular, that means that you know, these small dimensions of high frequency, even though them, each one of them separately has very little variance, there's a lot of them over there. And actually, how many there are of these smaller dimensions exactly compensate for the amount of loss variance. So that it is said that images, natural images, have a multi-scale structure with kind of equal amounts of variance, roughly, at different spatial scales otherwise known as a fractal. The more you zoom in into a natural image, you keep seeing structure. It never really becomes a, a perfectly you know, flat, equal brightness uh, patch if you have enough resolution in your images. And that's a fractal. Okay, so we got a bit more intuition from this. Um, so maybe now, can natural images tell us how many neurons we need to record? I took, what I did here is I took an image and I reduced it to 200 pixels. 
just by downsampling. And now I invite you to consider every pixel as one of the neurons we might have recorded from the brain. And so roughly this is the picture that we get as a, as a snapshot in time uh, from 200 pixels or neurons. Okay, there's not a lot of information here. We can tell a few things though. There, there's blue at the top, so there's probably the sky. There's some brown grayish thing here, so that could be a human structure. And there's some green down here, right? So that's probably vegetation, something green, something in nature. So we got some information from it, we just didn't get the details. And if we go now to maybe something like 10,000 pixels, equivalent to how many neurons we record in one of our typical experiments, we now can recognize that this is a picture of genelia. And so now you can see a lot more structure. You can see individual bushes here. You can see the lake. You can tell a little bit about the structure of the building. So that's already a lot better. Um, let's look at the original image, right? It, much better still, but it has 2 million pixels now. So information kept getting revealed to us at finer and finer scales as we recorded more pixels. However, the analogy is not quite complete because what we don't have with neural population, neural recordings that we have with these images is we know exactly where each pixel goes in the image. And that's not something that we have access to when we record neural activity. Uh, sure, we know the spatial position in tissue, but that doesn't really tell us much about the, the functional responses of the neurons. What we really want to know is where these neurons are sitting in some kind of functional response space. Um, so really, the way to think of these pictures as analogies is we have more something like this, where the pixels are shuffled, and we don't know exactly which pixels go together, because we don't know which neurons go together, which neurons represent similar things. Um, like, like the kinds of analysis I started with. And so, okay, to solve this problem, what looks like what we need to do is we need to figure out where the pixels go. And there is a solvable problem if I give you lots and lots of images like this. And it is a solvable problem if I give you lots of snapshots of neural activity. And the algorithms that we can use for that, and I'm going to do something very literal here, and I'm going to order neurons into a two-dimensional picture. I'm going to take neurons from where they were in our neural recording, sorted by one dimension, and just put them in 2D like this. I'm going to use very literally these basis functions from natural images to reconstruct this 2D space in which I put the neurons. Um, and I'm going to now do an optimization, essentially, to tell exactly what is the time course that would correspond to every one of these dimensions, and where do the neurons fit? And that's raster map 2D, the 2D version of our algorithm. Um, and when you fit it on neural data, starting first with data from Misha's lab, um, and there's an additional layer here of selected clusters, the rectangles that we, we've done quickly in a, in a GUI that comes with the software, to just basically cluster the kind of islands and, and little continents that are, that are making up this archipelago and this kind of representation. And on the right, I took all of these selected neurons and I arranged them again along the y-axis, the same way we've done before with single neuron, but now I'm doing it with clusters from this higher dimensional representation. And you can see in this kind of recording that's on the order of, of an hour or so, uh, where they did all sorts of different experiments, different uh, kind of visual stimuli, looking at those kinds of visual motor responses. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to go into the details of what, you know, every little pattern here means, but this is, in a sense, uh, a picture of the global state of the circuit at, at, at any one time. And if we map those, those neurons onto the actual zebrafish brain using the color of the, the place where we put the neuron, we overlay a color map to it. We take that color and we color the neuron with it. You can see the clustering structure. A lot of it is spatial. A lot of it relates to you know, neurons. What we didn't see in the mouse brain, right, is that a lot of it relates to uh, neurons that are nearby um, in the same brain area. And if you do it now on these kinds of recordings, so these are still 10,000 neuron recordings, but we did a lot of them. 
in five mice, covering most of the visual cortex of each mouse. And we again put a dot for every one of these neurons. This gives us some kind of representation of, of the space of stimuli in, and neurons encoded in, in the brain, in the visual cortex of mice. If we select cluster the same way we did with the zebrafish data, and we sort them, um, there's a lot of different patterns. There's a lot of groups of neurons, right? So every single group here is on the order of a few thousand neurons in this case, and they all have kind of similar patterns uh, that we found. And unlike the zebrafish data, where there was a bit more kind of global organization, you can see here that you know, almost every row is, is different. There's, there's a lot of kind of interesting higher dimensional structure happening in these visual cortex recordings. And when we quantify this algorithm, and some of you might have recognized it as um, similar to some other usual things you're familiar, more familiar with, like TISNI and UMAP, uh, these are embedding algorithms. These are typically used in our community for uh, gene expression data to, to embed those kinds of data sets. Um, and they might actually be good for those kinds of data sets. Uh, but for neural recordings, Rastamap uh, is able to kind of go to a higher correlation, predict more of the variance of neural activity. Um, and the reason has to do with the fact that we've constructed this high dimensional representation by mapping onto the data set of natural images. So we've, we've allowed this 2D representation to capture as much high dimensional variance as possible when we, so that when we collapse it in 2D, we retain as much of that information as, as possible. And that's pretty much all I had to say. Um, so I've shown you in the first part of the recording that spontaneous behaviors in complete darkness uh, drive high dimensional brain-wide neural activity. Um, and then I've shown you that visual stimuli also drive high dimensional neural activity. It's just restricted to visual cortex. Uh, and I've also suggested that it's as high as it can be, essentially without breaking the smoothness structure of the input-output transformation that, that visual cortex does. And then I've shown you continued development for the pipelines that we build and we support uh, Kilosort 2 for electrophysiology, sweet 2 p for calcium imaging, now in Python, and we're hoping to make Kilosort 2 in Python soon as well, uh, and then raster map uh, for visualization, both MATLAB uh, and Python. The few minutes I have left, I was just going to flash these other images of nice recordings that we do and the segmentations from sweet 2 p on the right. Uh, and here's one from some collaborators in the cerebellum, some Purkinje cell fibers. All right. They look nice on the big screen. That's the only reason I flashed them. I want to um, thank uh, the people in my lab. Uh, I haven't shown you a lot of new data from the lab, mostly just new analyses and, and, and packages and pipelines. Uh, but we're very excited about kind of taking it to the next step and um, really having that, that kind of virtual reality, um, more complex um, behavior and cognitive assay for, for mice. Other people that help us a lot are, are uh, Sarah, who does our surgeries, and the entire Vivarian team, uh, Jennifer for the spike sorting simulations. The JET team is really fabulous, and the people that have been helping us, helping a, a computational two computational people, me and Carson, get an experimental lab off the ground that couldn't have done it without them. Um, finally, others at Genelia that have uh, helped us and our collaborators outside. Thank you very much. All right, questions? Right here. Over there? Right. Thanks for the talk. It's amazing to see over 50,000 neurons in V1 simultaneously. So I have a question about the dimensionality of the net neural network activity. Uh, you pick up any cortical area, V1 or other parts. Uh, the, the dimensionality is pretty high, but as you showed. Uh, but it doesn't mean all those dimensions are meaningful to the downstream brain decoders. Maybe just a small subset 
of dimensions are actually used by a downstream decoder to do computation. All others are just ignored. So yeah. what's so so I think it's more important to understand what's the actual meaningful dimensionality in the neural network. So yeah. I, I want to hear your what what do you think is the effective approach to So I think we already that. have enough evidence by the mere presence of these dimensions of neural data that they're important and useful. And the reason is that uh, thalamus, I mean, the, the visual cortex fibers that come from the retina and go through the thalamus, that's a significant bottleneck. Uh, it's unlikely that some you know, extra information would be brought into the cortex only to be represented but not used there. Now, the other piece of information is that, in fact, I haven't shown you data, but when we show low-dimensional images, so images that are literally superpositions of like three different things, we still get a very high dimensional representation. Um, so we think that that points to a framework where Cortex is really trying to expand the dimensionality of the input it receives. Even when it receives kind of simple low dimensional input, it turns out for computational reasons, it can help a lot to expand it into high dimensions. And those computational reasons actually, if we were uh, 20 years ago or 10 years ago, I would have said in machine learning, there's this thing called the support vector machine that essentially blows up representation in high dimensional spaces so you can linearly decode there better. And that has been a model of V1 computation for a while. But today, since it's 2018, I would bring up deep learning and neural networks. 19. 19, 19 that's right. <laughs> I'll bring up neural networks uh, as, as essentially doing the exact kind of thing where we know that you take a, an image that can be pretty low dimensional and you construct all these simulated right neurons and they expand the representation before kind of compressing it again and they do much better classification because of that. So there are lots of computational reasons why you might want such a representation. You're right, it would be great if we could test it in some kind of cognitive or behavioral experiments. Um, and we'll, we'll see if we can generate the kind of high dimensional cognitive experiments to really test that. Any more questions? Yep. So what happens if instead of using the natural images, you either um, high, low pass filter them or just use, um, or use noise? Yeah, so we did all of those things. So here's the noise version. Uh, we actually high pass filtered them first because we wanted to remove the spectrum that they had that was decaying. So now the input spectrum is flat and the output spectrum still has a one over N. We, the low pass filter version corresponds most closely to this kind of reduced dimensionality of an image where you see, you know, going all the, it's the same image, but we projected it into this four dimensional space, just the, the biggest Fourier bases. And so that was done for the purpose of changing completely the statistics of the input image and just showing that you still get something out that looks like a power law. And there's a dividing line here, which relates to the theory, which says that as long as your input image is high dimensional in some way, you know, there's, you can't reduce its dimensionality, which is true of these four, you'll get a power law with an alpha close to one, which you see in these four examples. But as soon as you reduce the dimensionality of images to one, four, or eight, so you project them into these low dimensional spaces, uh, now your alpha suddenly starts increasing to 1.5, 1.65, 3.5. And that's all part of the theory. We can predict how big this alpha should be, or better yet, we can predict the limits on this decay as a function of how many inputs you give to the system. Any more questions now? Yes, Casper. Why doesn't the yellow line collapse as quickly as the gray line on the right-hand side here? Over here? Yeah. Right, so the gray line by construction goes to zero after exactly eight, four, or one coefficients. That's by construction. Yeah. Now, the fact that this yellow line has this slow decay is actually part of this kind of blowing up of, of dimensionality that we, we, we think about. Uh, it's taking different features of these images, and with, no, with nonlinear it has to be nonlinear, a nonlinear computation. You can expand the dimensionality into basically much higher dimensional. But there's a limit to how much you can expand. And that limit is very close to what we observe in practice. 
can't you also just expand the dimensionality by adding random noise? Is that, is that a nonlinear computation? <laughs> random noise that is not repeatable trial to trial is something that would not show up in, in, in these plots. So we've taken care to only look at signal variance that is repeatable from the, across the two trials of stimuli that we've shown. I see. Right over there. Do you have any control, for example, if you are imaging the V1 because the mesoscope can also image other areas? Do you see the same thing if you look at the auditory or somatosensory cortex? Yeah, good question. In spontaneous activity, it, it all looks very similar other than that one arousal dimension that I've shown you. It's in spontaneous activity in complete darkness. The problem with stimuli is other than vision and audition, it's very high, hard to drive with high dimensional stimuli for anything else. Like for whiskers, it's hard to generate the high dimensional stimulus. For touch, for, you know, I guess with smells, you can argue that you can do a lot of smells, but even that is hard because you need all these little bottles. So yeah, we've, uh, auditory cortex is on the side of the brain we can't access to with, um, with a microscope very well, so we then didn't look there. Visual cortex was the simplest thing we could, we could do this analysis in. Yeah, any more questions? All right, thank you very much then.